Atlantic and our great partners at the Aspen Institute. It's my privilege um, to welcome you to the Washington Ideas Forum, our seventh annual such gathering. If you'll bear with me, I want to start off this morning uh, with a story about wh what a struggle it can be, even in the most uncertain and even frightening of times, to keep your focus on what really matters here in Washington. My hope is to give you some sense for why we convene this event and of the values that we try to bring to the conversations across our two days together. As you may know, The Atlantic's been around a long time, and we've been lucky to publish some great writers over the years. It so happens that during the Civil War, when the magazine was headquartered in Boston, and the editors were casting around for someone to dispatch to Washington to judge the progress of the war, called on Nathaniel Hawthorne, who was then one of our readers. Hawthorne was already famous as the author of Scarlet Letter and Twice Told Tales, and he was at work on another novel, but as he put it, um, he felt that there's a kind of treason in insulating oneself from the universal fear of sorrow and thinking one's idle thought in the dread time of civil war. And so in March of 1862, Nathaniel Hawthorne came to Washington, and the result was a really remarkable record of that moment, which we published in the magazine later that summer. Hawthorne had an audience with Abraham Lincoln. He rode out and met General George McClellan, who was then in command of the Union troops. He actually inspected the Monitor, uh, the Union's ironclad battleship, which was just then back from its fight with the Merrimack in the Battle of Hampton Roads, and he examined the dents in the hull. He said they were about the breadth and depth of shallow, shallow saucers that were left by the Merrimack's artillery. And he mused about what the mechanization of war might mean. This new weapon, he wrote prophetically, was destined, along with others of the same breed, to annihilate whole navies and batter down old supremacies. But he added, this will not be, this will not be the last and most terrible improvement in the science of war. Like any good journalist, Hawthorne also found a bar to hang around in at the Willard Hotel. Everybody may be seen there, he wrote. It is the meeting place of the true representatives of the country, not such as are chosen blind by electors who take a folded ballot from the hand of a local politician, but men who gravitate or are attracted hither by real business or a native impulse to breathe the intensest atmosphere of the nation's life or a genuine anxiety to see how this life and death struggle is going to deal with us. Not only these, but all manner of loafers. Hawthorne was actually a very strange choice for this story. The founders of The Atlantic, James Russell Lowell and Harry Peter Stowe, Ralph Waldo Emerson and others, were all committed, really ardent abolitionists who were bent on the destruction of slavery. Hawthorne was actually pretty ambivalent about um, abolition and whether the, uh, the war itself was really justified, and his skepticism actually kind of seeps through throughout the piece. The editors gave Hawthorne plenty of freedom to make his substantive judgment, judgments, and he got some important stuff quite wrong. He was really dismissive of Lincoln, who had the nerve to keep Hawthorne waiting for half an hour while he finished his breakfast. But he had nothing but admiration for McClellan, General McClellan, who, of course, was a disaster as the leader of the Union troops. What's also interesting to me, looking back at the story, is to see where it was that the editors did choose to rein in their star writer. Hawthorne had nothing but contempt for the official doings in Washington, but his editors wouldn't let him get away with simply heaping scorn on the people he met. In fact, they cut whole pages out of his draft where he tried to do just that, and I love imagining the editorial back and forth between, really, they were all great writers, some of the greatest of the age and I admire the compromise they reached. In the end, Hawthorne responded to the editor's demands by inserting fake editor's notes into the article, in which he mocked himself and also his editors, and the result is this really modern kind of meta-commentary that's threaded through the whole piece, where Hawthorne, in his, this mock editor's voice, is commenting on his own writing. So, for example, when he starts to describe con uh, Congress, and you can feel Hawthorne beginning to get his dander up, he's suddenly interrupted by the following fake editor's note. 
We omit several paragraphs here in which the author speaks of some prominent members of Congress with a freedom that seems to have been not unkindly meant, but might be liable to misconstruction. As he admits he never listened to an important debate, we can hardly recognize his qualification to estimate these gentlemen in their legislative and oratorical abilities. And again later, as Hawthorne begins to describe Secretary of State William Seward as a pale, large-nosed, elderly man, the editors supposedly intervene again to say, we are again compelled to interfere with our friend's license of personal description and criticism. Even cabinet ministers, to whom the next few pages of the article were devoted, have their private immunities, which ought to be consciously, conscientiously observed, unless, indeed, the writer chanced to have some very piquant motives for violating them. The great elegance of this approach of proportion, even as he paid close attention to the culture and folkways of Washington, he didn't surrender at a time of civil war to idle chatter about the surfaces of things. He never lost sight of how high the stakes were. Still, as I said, he got some things wrong, and it's really useful, I think, for us at the Atlantic to remind ourselves of that as well. It's not easy for even the wisest of us to grasp the true significance and ramifications of events in our own times. So even as we try to do that, we should have some humility about the conclusions we reach. So those are the values and ambitions we try to bring to the Washington Ideas Forum and to all our coverage here. That fundamentally, politics really isn't just a game, and that decisions made or not made here have real consequences in world affairs and people's lives. In other words, we try to take Washington seriously, even if, as Hawthorne would have it, not quite so seriously at all times as Washington might take itself. 1862 would have been a particularly good year to hold this event, but we do have some advantages today um, over the Atlantic's founders in gathering. One is that social media exists, which means you can weigh in on the discussion at any point. The hashtag is hashtag ideas forum. And we've also got a new app for this event. Just search for Washington Ideas Forum in your app store of choice. It should work with any device, and it'll help you keep track of the agenda. Back in 1862, if we'd held this event, it probably would have been sponsored by somebody like the Nantucket Whalers Association. Um, <laughs> Nantucket was then the, the Saudi Arabia, or I guess you could say the North Dakota of the age. Men were still hunting whales to produce the oil to light the lamps by which Hawthorne's article was read. Um, today, I'd like to express our gratitude to a different set of underwriters for keeping the lights on um, and helping make this, this gathering possible. They are, at the presenting level, Athena Health, Comcast, NBC Universal, and Hitachi. At the supporting level, the American Federation of Teachers and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And at the contributing level, Allstate, Clear Channel Outdoor, and Steel Case. Thank you all very much. We're not living, thank goodness, in um, a period of universal fear and sorrow, as Hawthorne described his times. But we do have plenty of turmoil and change to reckon with ourselves. Boundaries have been erased in the Middle East. Other boundaries are being challenged in Eastern Europe and the South China Sea. At home, questions we've never successfully answered as a nation about race and inequality are being asked again with renewed force. And the major political parties seem as divided against themselves as they are from each other. These are the sorts of matters we hope to contend with over the next few days, and we're very grateful you've taken the time to think them through with us. And with that, I'll turn the stage over to Bob Corker, Senator Tennessee, will be interviewed by Susan Page of USA Today.